it's like how action actually happens downrange. Like you don't just go in and five minutes later you've got your high value target and you're safely on the helicopter. Nothing survives first contact with the enemy. There's always complications and we try to write that in. Welcome to the Pen and Sword podcast from Stratfor, a rain company. I'm Emily Donahue. There's one thing I know about working in a geopolitical intelligence unit of the fastest growing risk and security network in the U.S. It is that each day is filled with nonstop action, sort of the layman's view of a thriller. That's one reason I'm pleased to welcome Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson to this podcast. They are the team behind the Tier 1 thriller series featuring Navy SEAL John Dempsey. Their latest book, Collateral, is out now. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here, Emily. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Collateral is the sixth installment of the Tier 1 series. Can you give me a brief synopsis of the series and its protagonist? Sure. So um, from the very beginning, when we started to pen this series, um, we wanted to do something that was a little bit different. There's lots of good covert operations. There's lots of good SEAL team stuff out there, but we wanted to sort of combine those worlds. So we started with the question, what would happen if the premier JSOC level SEAL team were to get wiped out and there were basically literally no survivors? What, what would happen? How would you fill that vacuum? And so we began with that question in mind. And in our first three books, uh, we focused on an Iranian um, prota- or antagonist uh, that was pulling the strings. And so what we have in John Dempsey is the sole survivor of the loss of the tier one SEAL team. And he is presumed dead as well. And so he is then recruited by his former boss, the former CSO of his SEAL team, who now runs a very shadowy organization called Ember. Uh, and he's chartered to join the team, set up a direct action unit with the original purpose of hunting down those responsible for the deaths of his brothers and teammates. And so that sort of launches the series uh, and the idea of this small unit covert operations team. Each of you being a veteran, among other things, you've both got quite a resume behind you. Um, (laughs) Do you consider these books a military thriller or an espionage thriller, given the dichotomy of his personality? Yeah, this series is uh, pretty exciting for us to write because it, it really does incorporate both of those elements. And if you if you start at the beginning of the series what you'll find is this evolution of the character John Dempsey from a door kicking seal to, you know, what we like to call a spook uh, term of art uh, that's used in the industry. So John is struggling with that evolution from working on this very uh, tip of the spear, direct action, you know, seal team mentality to having to work in uh, a less structured more individual basis. And uh, as his character evolves, he faces a lot of challenges coming to grips with that. And I think you can appreciate this, Emily, is the is that shade of gray that exists in that other world, right? The door kicking seal, it's really a black and white world. You're given a high value target and you go and execute that. And then you come back and you went, wind up back in Virginia Beach and you have a beer. But in that gray world, of uh, not just geopolitical uh, vagueness, but also there's a lot of moral ambiguity that can exist in in some of those worlds. And so evolving from that military to more covert espionage uh, type uh, operator is something that would be difficult uh, for some people. And so that's what we tried to build in John. So it makes it fun because we can pull in elements of both. Yeah, I mean, when I was going through Collateral and the book before it, I was noticing that in his transition from sort of a team person to a singular uh, actor, there's a lot of, um, as you put it, ambiguity. Do you consider that this is a good transition or is this a tough transition? I think it's a necessary, difficult transition for for John. And I think it's something that happens in the real world, too, uh, with some people that make that transition. Um, It's not that you become less of a team. And one thing we do differently in our books is we don't ever have him as that complete lone wolf rogue agent out on his own type thing. There's a team involved in real covert operations, as I know you're aware. And so we do try to keep that element. 
But as you can see, we have evolved him into more of an individual player in a lot of his operations. And as you saw at the end of Collateral, he's still got a ways to go, and uh, he's got some more evolving left to do in the in the upcoming books. So um, it's not whether it's good or bad. I think it's necessary, but you use the word difficult. I think that's a very accurate word for that transition. So let's talk a little bit about your target audience. Now, in the press material for your series, the Tier 1 series, there's been a lot of comparison to Jack Carr, Mark Greeny type authors. We've been lucky enough to host both of those on this podcast. But your demographic, would you say that it's a straight thriller demographic or would you have a different kind of audience in mind? I think that our primary demographic is the military active duty and uh, veteran military communities. You know, we as two veterans, we, we're very much invested in the veteran and active duty communities. Um, and I think that we take great pride and put a lot of effort into trying to write as authentic of military characters as we can. And one of the things um, that Jeff and I often talk about is that, you know, in real life, you're dealing with these. Um, ordinary people who are performing under extraordinary circumstances and doing extraordinary things. There's no quote unquote Superman, you know, in our stories. Would you agree with that, Jeff? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, having worked in that community, you know, and also knowing those those two wonderful authors who I know strive for the same thing, Mark and and Jack are both uh, amazing people, good friends. Um, I think that writers like Jack, writers like Mark, and what we try to do as well is to is to make it feel realistic. Like we want it to be entertaining. Obviously we're not going to write about the mundane rote stuff that we all know exists in this world. We're going to, it's going to be an action thriller, but we really want to know that, you know, teammates from our past um, friends that we have that are still out on the pointy tip of the spear would read the book and go, yeah, you know, if that were to happen, that's what I would do. So we do try to, it's not that the action necessarily is, has to be realistic. Although we try to do that, it's more, the characters. We want the the people, both the antagonists and protagonists, to resonate with people as very realistic. You know, Brian said ordinary people doing extraordinary things. My time in that community, that's exactly what I walked away with. These are ordinary men and women with an absolutely extraordinary drive and sense of patriotism to get a mission done. And so that's what we try to do is we try to keep the realism of how these characters respond to the situation to one another. And, you know, hopefully we do that. So I think that's, and that's a way in which we sort of bridge that gap between what is our demographic. I think there's something here for everyone. We have a huge number of, um, female readers uh, in our demographic. You know, we, we are able to track those things through through our publisher. We have younger people, we have older people, active duty, people who have never served. So I think you got to put a little something into a thriller for everybody, and we've certainly tried to do that. Well, I very much enjoy reading these. The last two in your series uh, are the only two that I've been lucky enough to read, but I was able to pick them up. I was able to understand what was going on. You know, when you speak about ordinary people in extraordinary situations, one of my colleagues, Fred Burton, uh, said that he got his start reading thrillers and mysteries in the between times of his work when he was on the plane. I mean, did you find that there was downtime amid the uh, extraordinary times? Oh, for sure. And and um, it's funny, isn't it? You think of reading as something you do to escape. And yet I can tell you, just like Fred, um, when I had downtime, this was the genre I went to. You'd think I would go to something that would escape from that world that you were actually immersed in. Uh, but it's just, you know, I grew up reading it. I, I read Le Car, I read Ludlum. I read all of those amazing books. Um, and they were an inspiration for me as a writer. But maybe even career choices I've made over my life were informed somewhat by that. So, yeah, there's downtime now. Towards the end of my military career, I used some of that downtime to write. Uh, instead of to read, but I've always been gravitated to this to this genre, which I guess is a little strange, or maybe not. Each of you has a, an extraordinary career, and each of you has a unique perspective that, as you pointed out, people like me really have never experienced what is in this book or in this series, but it's very relatable. Um, how would you describe your books? How would you describe the approach that you take to writing them? 
We uh, are very intentional about trying to give uh, a good analogy is like a tick on a hound. We want people to feel like they're going along with Dempsey and the team like from day one. And for those who have served, you realize from the day that you show up at boot camp, basic training, I mean, there's not a whole lot of hand holding. I mean, you're thrown into the fire and you're expected to just get with the program. And it's, it's that way uh, throughout the entire training pipeline. You know, um, in my case, I was submarine officer. So you show up uh, after you complete your, your basic training and you show up at nuclear power school, um, you, you have to work your butt off. Nobody's going to hold your hand and get you through that. And when you show up on your first, at your first command on your first submarine, uh, you don't know how anything works. And everybody's very busy. Um, and you, you're just expected to jump right in. And so we sort of take that same approach to the reader. And we, you know, we, we looked at it and said, you know what? The readers can handle it. We're not going to explain every single thing. There happens to be a glossary in the back of every one of our books to help with the military speak. But it's pretty cool because we get emails from readers all the time, clearly people that are have had no active duty military experience. And they'll say, you know what? This is fantastic. It took me a little while to catch on to what's going on. And now I love it because I feel like I'm right there. Uh, with Dempsey beside him on every mission. Well, that's what one of the things that I noticed is that you're you are including people into the narrative without either talking down to them or over explaining, and that makes it that much more exciting. And it's a challenge, though, isn't it? Right. So, I, as a reader and a writer, I can tell you that um, you want to learn, but you don't want to be taught. If that makes sense, right? Like you don't want stuff explained to you. Uh, because it it kills the excitement and it slows the pace and and the suspense of the book, but you do want to learn. And so, as a writer, you you work very hard to find that balance. You want to bring the reader in, like Brian was saying, and you also want to share a glimpse of this world that you've had experiences in. But if you spend too much time spoon feeding it to the to the reader, then the enjoyment really decreases, and they and they and you lose them. So you've got to do it in a way. Uh, that they can enjoy and doesn't kill the story. And I think you do that, just like Brian said, by not underestimating your reader. I mean, I know as a reader, I hate it when someone explains something to me and I'm like, yeah, duh, I already know that. Uh, And so you got to find that balance. Give them just enough to help them with context to figure things out uh, without without teaching them too much. But don't write so far over their head that it's not enjoyable either. It's a struggle, but it's if you work hard at it, I think you can find that balance. And and one of the other ways that we do that is, you know, we think about, and we, we've had some funny conversations about this, because sometimes you'll read a book where a character picks up a, a weapon and they just go into this internal monologue about all the details of the caliber bullet, the length of the barrel, how the grip, blah, 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 blah. And Jeff and I say, you know, like I never once when I was standing officer deck would look at the fire control system and say, that's a Mark 42 fire control (laughs) system using a such and such process. You know, you just don't do that. You know, you, you know what it is. You call it by its name. You go to look at the screen to see the fire control solution that the fire control technician has put together based on sonar and, and if you do it that way, you're in the character's eyes and you're using the tools and the machines and the, and the tactics the way that the character would, it feels much more authentic. Yeah. You've never once said, let me grab my SOP mod M4. You just say, let me get my gun, right? So I think that's a good way to explain it, Brian. Although Fred Burton would ask, which kind of gun do you carry these days? <laughs> Yeah, you know what, Fred Burton That's a great has question. asked. He has asked me what kind of gun I carry these days. I can tell you that I'm a Sig Sauer guy myself. So I and and he and I have gone back and forth on that over on on Twitter once. <laughs> in fact, so um, yeah. So I think you do need to know the weapons and you need to know what you like and don't like. Uh, but you know, you don't want to get down into the nitty gritty. Fred's a great guy, boy. I've really enjoyed interacting with him. Hold that thought. We'll be right back. I wanted to cut away for a moment to talk with you about Stratfor Worldview, Rain's premier geopolitical publication and a go-to source for diplomats, businesses, professionals, and individuals around the world. Together, Stratfor and Rain help you understand the why behind what's going on now, because what happens next, well, that's up to you. If you'd like to learn more, consider a subscription to Stratfor Worldview. Podcast listeners can access a special rate at stratfor.com slash 
podcast offer. That's stratfor.com slash podcast offer. Now, let's get back to our interview. Brian, I wanted to get back to something that you said is when you get your first command of a submarine and you don't know what you're doing, it kind of reminds me of that movie with Matthew McConaughey um, about a guy who takes over a sub command in World War II. I must have watched that movie 15 times and I enjoy it every time. These books read to me like a movie looks. Is there a series in the works about your series? <laughs> we take that as a huge compliment that you feel that cinematic aura uh, in the story. And, you know, it was it was really cool. Jeff and I, like I said, we like to swap our stories from emails from fans and stuff. And, and we got one a couple months ago that somebody wrote and they said, this is the first uh, series since... The Lord of the Rings, where I feel like it's a movie, you know, that I'm watching. And and um, so, yeah, we, we spend a lot of time trying to craft really um, tense and sort of cinematic action scenes. And I think one thing that separates us from other writers in the genre is that we write long action scenes. Our action scenes sometimes span multiple chapters. It's not like two paragraphs of action. They are almost like little mini plays that like each of our action scenes is almost a three act play in and of itself that starts with an event and has complication and gets crazy with the climax. And then it it resolves and back to the story. But that's something that we, we take a lot of pride in. So thanks for asking that question. And Jeff, do you want to, well, I mean, you know, obviously we would love to be able to tell you that coming soon from Paramount (laughs) um, and we've certainly, we've certainly had conversations with some people. I'd love to see a, Cinema, cinematic representation of Dempsey and his universe uh, one day when the time is right. Um, but it is fun to be able to create something that's very visual. And, you know, he was talking about the, the three act structure to an action scene. He's not talking about like a fight scene, as you know, because you've read them, Emily. It's like how action actually happens downrange. Like, you don't just go in and five minutes later, you've got your high value target and you're safely on the helicopter. Nothing survives first contact with the enemy, no plan ever. And so there's always complications. And we try to write that in, in a way that can be very visual for the reader. One of the things that we keep going back to, or at least I keep going back to, is something you each said earlier in the conversation, is that your protagonist is an ordinary person in an extraordinary circumstance. And yet your villains are quite different. Can you talk a little bit about the process you use for crafting your villains and and how they sort of each have their own arc in the series? Yeah, I I like that question. And I really appreciate that you picked that up in in reading the books, because that's a lot of work um, to write a book that has a compelling protagonist that you don't necessarily make sympathetic is, is a bit of a challenge, but it's a good reflection of reality, which seems to be the recurring theme of the conversation. We try to reflect reality. And what we remind ourselves is, Uh, and we do this constantly, every bad guy is a good guy in their mind, right? Like to them, Dempsey's the bad guy. Like in our Iranian trilogy, these VVAC operators were doing what they wanted to do for the good of their country, just like Dempsey is. And so if you start there, as you build these characters, they become more real to you as a writer. And then it's easier to give them relationships, give them their own motivations. Um, you know, the, in, in our first trilogy, this uh, main protagonist had a wife and he had a son who he lost. And we build that. Now, not to the point where it's onerous, I hope, but it makes the character come a little bit more alive and it increases the stakes because you see that they're not just evil for evil's sake. They have real skin in their game too. And they have real hopes and dreams and goals. Uh, and it makes it more challenging for your good guy to overcome that. And so it's a lot of work to do that, but I think it's something that, um, you know, our favorite writers do. And you, you mentioned Mark and Jack are two great examples of that. There's dozens of others, but when you read a book that really sucks you in, it's because the protagonist is just as real and compelling as the antagonist. And so that's what we try to do. As I mentioned earlier, Strat4 is a geopolitical intelligence company, and I couldn't help but notice that 
geopolitics, as you mentioned this as well, plays a considerable role in this series. In Red Spectre, the book before Collateral, you got into detail about a pipeline very similar to Nord Stream 1 and the fraught geopolitics around it. How do you decide what geopolitical elements to focus on? Well, first of all, let's just say that, you know, Jeff and I follow geopolitics. It's just something that we're interested in and it's been part of our professional careers from the beginning. So we're always trying to stay current on current events and, and what's going on around the world. And then because of that, you know, you see different uh, news articles and, you know, we, we try to pull out our Andrews and Wilson little crystal ball. And it usually starts with like a what if scenario. So with like back at book four, which is the beginning of this trilogy, American Operator, right before Red Spectre, uh, which you've read. Um, it sort of kicks off with this question, you know, we were saying, you know, we got these uh, B-61 nukes at Encirlik, and, you know, are they there as an anchor, or are they there for a different reason? And what would happen if Turkey made a pivot towards Russia, and how would that happen, and could those nukes be taken? And so you start these sort of dialogues, and the inevitable result is that Jeff and I are like two, you know, eight-year-olds in the backyard playing army uh, to steal an expression from one of Jeff's favorites. <laughs> um, you know, and we, we, we're we like, oh, yeah, well, what would happen if, if this happened and that happened and that happened? So it all starts with that what-if question. So you nailed it. I mean, in Red Spectre, that question was about Nord Stream and energy independence for the Baltics. And to what lengths would the Kremlin go to prevent the Baltics from being purely energy independent? And in this book, this new book, Collateral, we're really excited because we, we take the stakes up again. And, you know, we already saw a power grab where Moscow took Crimea. You know, what if they have designs on reclaiming all of that Nova Russia territory from across southern Ukraine? And how would they go about doing it? Let me ask you guys a question about, you know, you earlier said that you get to know your characters and you live with them and you ask, what if, what if? Do you ever disagree since you're a two-person team? Do you ever disagree about where somebody's going to end up? So I'll tell you, Emily, that's it's, it's a great question. Of course, it's one we get a lot because we are co-authors, which is not that common in this particular genre, especially. And it sounds like the answer that you give because you're doing an interview, but it is the truth that we very, very rarely, if ever, disagree. And I can say that we've never disagreed to the point where it was a conflict. Now, it's not unusual for us to say, oh, well, I don't know about that. What about this? Um, and we have those conversations 10 or 15 times a day when we're in the middle of a project. Um, but we began the writing relationship as two military veterans. And, and you know, both of us have worked in communities where it is all about teamwork. And that sounds trite, but it's definitely true in special warfare and in the submarine community. This idea of mission before self, team before self, it's something that becomes a part of you. And so when we came together as a writing team, the reason we thought we might actually be able to work together is because we had that, that shared ethos. And so we tend to look at the project as our project. You know, Brian likes to say in interviews sometimes, it's like, you know, I have, I'm married to a beautiful woman, Wendy, and we have four kids, but she doesn't say, well, okay, I'm in charge of Connor and Ashley and you're in charge, you know, we're in charge of the parents of all four kids and everything we do, we do together for their benefit. And we sort of approach our stories that way. It's what can we do to make it the best story that we both feel ownership for at the end? Now we recognize that we have different strengths and weaknesses and we definitely capitalize on that for one another. But it is very unusual for us to disagree. And in general, if when we have those rare times we have, we'll sort of say, okay, well, let's give that a try and see where it goes uh, if you feel strongly about it. And we do that. And to the best of my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but every time we've had that and we said, okay, you feel stronger about it than I do, let's move forward. I don't think we've ever turned and had to change it back. Um, so it's just a mutual respect and sort of a team, team focus thing. Brian, do you have anything to add? Oh, no, that's, I mean, he summarized it perfectly. And, and that, that really is our approach is we, we stay very low key because once you take the ego out of it and you look at it as, okay, you know, we're on the same team, we want the same objective to write the best book possible. 
then it doesn't matter like who wrote which sentence or whose idea was the best because it's a 400 freaking page book. Like there's a <laughs> lot of ideas in that book, <laughs> right? Like it doesn't happen in a day. It's not like, you know, we, we set out on a, a march and Jeff got to lead the march and then we're back an hour later. Like that's not how it works. It is a long slog. So, you know, there's division of labor and there's all kinds of decisions and discussions. And by the end of the book, God knows only who, who came up with what. And, and it just it just doesn't matter. And I think he's right. Like, I, I can literally think on you know on one hand, the times where one of us is like, you know what? I don't know about this. I just I don't want to do it. And the other guys always says, sure, like, no problem, because that element of trust and. Um, that's very, that, that's a big weight off your shoulder. If you know that, if I know that I can go to Jeff and say, Hey, I want to change this, or I don't like this, or I don't feel comfortable about it. And he's not going to judge me he has no reason to stick with a over B. It, it removes a lot of impediments and it just allows us to focus on, on the story. Now, we happen to be speaking about book six in the series, and now that book six is in the book, so to speak, what's in store for you as an author team? Well, we've got a bunch of things going on, Emily. I appreciate you asking because uh, we've made a few really big announcements over the last few months. First of all, um, the Tier 1 universe is growing. We have a fan favorite within the Tier 1. Uh, his name is uh, Chunk Redman. You may have seen him in Red Spectre, him and his uh, merry band of Navy SEALs. They are minor characters who've made several guest appearances. And from the very beginning, we knew that once we wiped out our fictitious uh, tier one SEAL team, we'd have to reconstitute it. So we now have the opportunity to launch a new series called uh, Sons of Valor. Uh, and that's coming next June from uh, Blackstone. And it's going to feature uh, Chunk Redman and his SEALs reconstituting a tier one uh, SEAL team to fill the vacuum left behind in the first tier one book. So we're super excited about that. Uh, and then I'll let Brian tell you about uh, the other two things we got going on. Yeah, so sort of dovetailing uh, with what Jeff just said is uh, there's a, a very established uh, name in the industry. You've probably heard of Webb Griffin, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he uh, passed away recently. And the estate, in uh, combination with uh, Penguin, has reached out and asked us to uh, sort of pick up the mantle and carry the presidential agent series on. So we're super, super excited to be able to take over the presidential agent series and continue uh, Charlie Castile. He's the main character. Continue the adventures of Charlie Castile and and uh, some of the great characters from that series. So this is our first time that we'll ever be writing um, somebody else's characters doing uh, another sort of landmark series. So we're we're really, really excited. Excited and a little intimidated. <laughs> well, you're definitely going to be busy, right? I mean, you've got your own new series, which I'm so excited about. That sounds like a, it's going to be great. And then the existing series, um, how are you going to avoid mixing up your characters? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Fortunately, we, um, uh, they're different enough and we write them separately enough, uh, that it, there's not too much risk of that. The, Two in the shared universe will be particularly easy. Uh, and actually, we have a fourth series called The Shepherds coming out next September uh, from Tyndale House, which is a uh, faith-based uh, action-adventure series also featuring a Navy SEAL. So we're actually going to be doing four books a year. So it's we're less worried about mixing up the characters than just getting the work done. It's, uh, it's going to be quite an adventure trying to get all of this content done and meet all of our deadlines. But man, we're just so excited for the opportunities we've been given uh, by some amazing editors. It's a huge inspiration for wannabe writers. Four books a year. That's incredible. Congratulations. Thank you so Thanks. much. Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson are the authors of the Tier 1 series. The latest book, Collateral, is out now. Thank you both so much for being on the Pen and Sword podcast. We Thank you for having us. Thanks. We'll have details about Collateral, the sixth in the Tier 1 series, in our show notes at Stratfor Worldview. There you can read more about the U.S. and Russia jockeying for geopolitical supremacy and find out what will happen next in that relationship. Podcast listeners get a special subscription rate. Check it out at stratfor.com slash podcast offer. That's all one word, stratfor.com slash podcast offer. I'm Emily Donahue. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.